We're recording. Okay. Well, welcome everybody to Oral Pharmaceuticals in Eye Care. This is Optometric Education and Consultants National Webinar Series, Sunday Morning Edition. It's my uh, my great pleasure to introduce our speakers for this uh, this morning, Dr. Greg Caldwell and Dr. Tracy Offerdahl. Greg Caldwell is a graduate of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry, and he completed a one-year residency in primary care and heart disease at the University uh, the University's Eye Institute. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a fellow of the Optometric Glaucoma Society, and a diplomate of the American Board of Optometry. He is an ocular disease co consultant in Duncan, Duncansville and Johnstown, PA. He is participating in multiple FDA investigations, and he has lectured nationally and internationally and is a foremost educator uh, in optometry. Joining him is a long-term friend uh, of OEC, and that's Dr. Tracy Offerdahl. She attended Temple University School of Pharmacy in Philadelphia. Uh, she, her residency was also at Temple University where much of her time is spent in internal medicine and infectious diseases. She's on faculty at Salus University in the Department of Optometry. She's a course director and instructor for all systemic pharmacology courses for students in optometry, audiology, and the physician assistant program. She's also a practicing clinical pharmacist for the practice in Rosemont, PA. And she has a unique uh, distinction that she is not an optometrist, she's a PharmD, but she is also a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Greg Caldwell and Dr. Tracy Offerdell, Oros Pharmaceuticals and Eye Care, Pearls from Optometrist and a Pharmacist. Guys, take it away. Thanks, Joe. And uh, Tracy, it looks like I got to fix you. Your, your farm D here. I made you a fellow oh, yeah, optometrist uh, uh, today. So I apologize for that. So here are my disclosures. Um, I think the, there's a few important bullet points on here. The first one is Tracy and I have independently made this presentation. There's no influence from any of these companies that are listed here down below. And you can see I'm not going to read the whole list to you. Alcon to Hero, from Allergan to Inovia as advisory boards. You know, I put this list on here, not really to brag. Um, I'm not really proud, but I'm not bragging about it either. Yeah, you know, just, you know, in order to kind of stay ahead of the curve and offer good education, you, you just kind of have to, you know, be a part of these companies, listen to what they're talking about, see what's coming and be able to, uh, to uh, you know, offer it to uh, the colleagues here. I do sit as the PA medical director for Involve. It's a managed Medicaid. I'm helping out with a registry, which is more of an outcome-based registry rather than a MIPS. Here's more important. I have no financial proprietary interest in any of the products or services, and the content of this course will be presented without any commercial bias and doesn't claim any superiority. And I think most everyone knows Joe and I are the owners of Optometric Education Consultants. There we go, Tracy. I got you as a farm D there. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I have not much to disclose, uh, really nothing other than to uh, reiterate what Greg said, which is we have no financial or proprietary interest in any of the companies, products, or services that we'll mention, and the presentation was prepared independently. I had this slide recently, just to kind of echo, I think, you know, uh, Tracy and I kind of assume, and, and Joe kind of assume that everyone kind of knows who we are, who we practice, how we practice. And, you know, I practice in Western Central Pennsylvania. And this picture here is showing, here's the building uh, that we own. And, you know, I have six exam lanes or we have six exam lanes in our office, electronic health records and optical, you know, a bunch of fun equipment that we get to work with. Basically the point is, you know, out in the world world, like most of the people that are on here taking this, taking this webinar. Yeah, I kind of sent Tracy a quick text yesterday. Hey, send me some pics, kind of, you know, Tracy works in academia, but Tracy, you also have your own little apothecary. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I didn't take pictures yesterday because I was the only practitioner and yesterday was a bit of a nightmare, but um, yeah, so there's an apothecary um, in Rosemont outside Villanova, Pennsylvania. And we've all worked there, all the practitioners together for, my gosh, it'll be 32 years. And, um, you know, we have 
a patient care portion of our practice and then a good old fashioned family pharmacy. We do compounding of intramuscular medications, ophthalmics, all different types of things. So yeah, it's a, it's a great place to be. Thanks. So, you know, the point is Tracy's in academia, but she's also out, you know, seeing patients, dealing with the insurances, prior authorizations that are, that are out there. So here's polling question number one, just real quick for, you know, it's an oral pharmaceutical and, you know, instead of starting off with the antibiotics, I kind of had a few in the back of my mind. I wanted Tracy and I to kind of, you know, talk about here and, uh, Epilerinone, is that, do I have it correct there, Tracy? How do I say that, so? Epilerinone. Epilerinone, thank Yeah, epilerinone, yep. Epilerinone, so have you ever prescribed oral epilerinone and then have you seen oral epilerinone used in eye care? So let that, that roll in. Give it some time here. Hey, Joe, I'm gonna text you a number. Uh, maybe call them. I think they might be having some problems here. Right. Let me see if I can do that without uh, without doing too much uh, taking too much time here. I think I have it. North Carolina. Uh, some name Mark. I don't know. All right. Go right ahead. And then we'll end this poll and get Grail going. All right, I'm gonna end the poll. And it's kind of what I sus suspected here that, you know, you know, two people prescribed it and, you know, majority haven't. And then we have a majority of here that, you know, that haven't seen it. And that's why I wanted to kind of put this, oh, I guess it should share the results. There it is, guys. Um, there's the results of the poll. You can see it's basically what I just said, a majority. And that's kind of why I wanted to bring this one up here and, and talk about it. Where I see this used is in central serous retinopathy. You know, it's a neurosensory retinal detachment, not a retinal pigmented epithelial detachment. And these are kind of the old ways. You had this little blister right here where you have the neurosensory detachment. You can kind of see that classic smokestack where you know, it would fill up if the break was inferior, you'd get that classic smokestack on a fluorescein. We really don't use uh, fluorescein angiography anymore with central serous. We're using, you know, a lot of OCT angiography where we can, or OCT, not angiography, but OCT B scan. And here I like this one because this is a retinal pigment and epithelial detachment. This is a central serous. And as we're going to see, there is a, you know, it's, it's an issue with the choroid. So when you see central serous, this is kind of just the tip of the issue. And I got a couple more slides here. Again, not to be confused with a retinal pigmented epithelial detachment. That's what this is here, a retinal pigmented. You can see that the neurosensory retina is attached. The RPE is hyperfluorescing. And again, this is just an example above of what a the difference between a retinal pigment and a central serous is. And these next few slides are just kind of to show you that the issue is uh, in, the, uh, in the choroid. You can see how thick this choroid is. Um, you can see it's the tip of the iceberg. You'll hear this called a packy choroid from time to time, uh, an extra thick choroid. And here is just a patient of mine that came in and we did the uh, OCT and we're measuring how thick this, and you can see this is like 536 microns, you know, and, and under the macula, it should be about 225 microns on average. So you can see that this is, you know, two to three times thicker. You can see the leakiness that's going on. And then you can just kind of see the tip of the iceberg. Now I've been sending... You know, we treat these, we tell the patients uh, in, in Pennsylvania, you know, relax, you know, try to, you know, what's going on in your life, you know, take a vacation and so on and so forth. And uh, there's a, some of the times that that just doesn't work, right? And you just can't, you don't see it disappear. But uh, sent a few of these over to the retinologist because we don't have this prescribing right in Pennsylvania. And over the last few years, you know, this medicine I was being seen used 
uh, to treat these and treat these successfully. And here is just out of the International Journal of uh, Retinal Vitreous, and there's plenty of other articles that are out there regarding it. But you can see here it talks about you know, oral epilarinone being used at 25 to 50 milligrams per day for central serous. And it basically comes down here and says, you know, try and use it a little bit earlier in disease, maybe before that retinal epithelium changes uh, occur. So with that being said, I really didn't know much about uh, this medication. So, you know, Tracy being a pharmacist, and this is supposed to be pearls from an optometrist and a pharmacist, kind of as I would do if we were sitting at, uh, at having a glass of wine somewhere. So Tracy, can you talk about this medication? Sure, and it's not random that a plerinone is studied or, or even used in patients um, with, what is it, uh, central, central serous? Yeah. Choreoretinopathy, yep. Choreoretinopathy, uh, central serous chore choreoretinopathy. Uh, choroidal retinopathy. I probably won't get that right. But what I what I found interesting was that, you know, some of this is randomly found, which happens on occasion where you would have um, some retrospective data looking at patients who had this issue. Um, and then it turns out, oh, look, they were taking a plerinone, usually for um, heart failure, symptoms associated with heart failure, which I'll talk briefly about. And all of a sudden, their you know, um, evaluation looked a little bit better, they were less uh, symptomatic, et cetera. And, and what has been found is that in a good number of patients with um, the CSCR, I'm just gonna call it that, um, they have an over-representation or an over-upregulation of not only glucocorticoid receptors, but also mineralocorticoid receptors. And glucocorticoids, you know, are, you know, things like drugs working like prednisone, prednisolone, methylprednisolone. But on the flip side, on the mineralocorticoid part, that's where you have fluid accumulation, which happens with our steroids as well. So when you go into choroidal vasculature, there is found to be uh, a upregulation of the mineralocorticoid receptors. What does that do? It causes a fluid shift. So when you have upregulation in the choroidal vasculature of mineralocorticoid receptors, that's when fluid starts to come in. You get that serous part and um, it's just due to vasodilation. And then you have the fluid accumulation in the retina. So all that being said, it's not random that this drug would have some benefit in most patients that have kind of that particular um, presentation of CSCR. So eplerinone is brand name Inspra, came out probably 10, 11 years ago. It sounds like spironolactone, um, eplerinone, spironolactone. You know, they kind of have the same ending. It's a potassium sparing diuretic, and it's also called a mineralocorticoid or, or aldosterone antagonist. I'm not gonna go into too much detail other than to tell you as a potassium sparing drug, that means that more potassium is left in the bloodstream when patients take this medication. That's significant because there are potassium receptors in these mineralocorticoid uh, receptors in the same area in the vasculature of the, the choroid. So, it's not that surprising that you would see some benefit. The biggest plus with the eplerinone as compared to what we typically have used, spironolactone, spironolactone causes huge shifts in hormones in both males and females. And I think this tends to be more of a disease, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, Greg or Joe, more of a disease of male patients as a, um, you know, kind of a, a generalization. So in a male patient, a plerinone would be less likely to cause male breast enlargement, um, decreases in testosterone, which can cause other issues. So anyhow, I say, you know, keep an eye on it because I think it's really going to um, start to be used in more patients. Yeah, Tracy, I can just echo that, you know, I see the retinologist using in my area, using it more and more and with successful outcomes. So, you know, it's something I'm going to be reaching out to our state board to see if we as optometrists can uh, prescribe it. And you and I as educators can help people feel comfortable uh, prescribing it. I'm going to launch this second poll here. Is, you know, have you ever prescribed oral steroids? I 
I have a sneaky suspicion this won't be a little bit higher than E player in them. Uh, it looks like a question came in, Tracy. Any side effects at that dose? Yeah, I was just going to type one out. So in general, it's very well tolerated, which is always the first thing I go to. It's no fun to have a drug that might work for something if the side effects outweigh the benefit of the drug, of course. But eplerinone is very well tolerated, even at 25 to 50 milligrams per day, which isn't that high of a dose. Um, you know, you might see some small changes in blood pressure, but even that is not significant. Um, it, it would be more of maybe gastrointestinal side effects. Um, and we would watch for drug interactions because since this drug does help retain potassium in the bloodstream, we would just have to watch and do occasional checks of potassium levels in the bloodstream if the patient's on like ACE inhibitors, et cetera, or angiotensin receptor blockers, but really well tolerated. And I don't say that often. Yeah, and the good news is if we use it as optometrists, we're not going to use it for all the other probably indications. This would be an off-label use. Right. Um, and the patient most likely would not be on it for long periods of time, which is, you know, yeah. that's what happens a lot of the times in optometry. So, so I ended the poll. I shared the, the results here. Have you ever prescribed oral steroids? And with just 47% uh, or yes, and just, you know, so it's almost a 50-50 ratio there. And the reason why I put that polling question in <clears throat> is because of this case here. And I see these roll in from time to time. And they're this, this kind of these delayed hypersensitivities. You know, sometimes I see people that are using maybe things to kind of grow their lashes or new creams around their eyes and wrinkle creams. Um, that they get this kind of delayed hypersensitivity that's out there. Remember, there's four types of hypersensitivities out there, you know, type one, two, three, and four. True ocular allergy is only one in four, right? So it's the, the uh, acute, the IgE mediated. Then you have that delayed, and that's what we see for those that have used like uh, the the uh, alpha-GAN, the 0.2%. We don't see it as much with the 0.1%. But they get this kind of raccoon because it's a different type of cell mediated reaction where the skin becomes involved. And a lot of these times, you know, sometimes people come in, I never really find the, the antigen or what causes it, but it just seems that, you know, like a Medrol dose pack works well for, for these patients. And uh, you know, a lot of times it's, you know, it's, I prescribe the the four milligrams, 21 tablets, it's, uh, but they do have this dose pack. So I just thought that, you know, Tracy, if you would like to kind of talk about this and then your, you know, your next slide is about the, about the prednisolone dose pack. If you want to kind of chat about these two, that'd be awesome. Sure. So the Medrol dose pack, everybody knows we, we love it because it's kind of patient proof or public proof, as I like to say, in the sense that the directions are written on there very specifically, you know, as compared to a prednisone prescription where many times practitioners will write, just use as directed and they're telling the patient how to take, you know, prednisone and taper it over the course of five to 10 days. And the patient's always like, yeah, okay, I understand. I understand. And then they get, you know, out to the car or at home and they're like, wait, what did they tell me to do and how to take it. So we like that about uh, methylprednisolone. Over in the left-hand side, left-hand corner, you can see I have um, Medrol dose pack equivalent uh, or methylprednisolone to prednisone. And that's just to show you that Sometimes Medrol dose packs, the generic, um, go on back order. They're hard to get. Uh, it's even becoming an issue now with some of the supply, supply chain issues. So you can give patient prednisone to do the same thing. Um, four milligrams of Medrol is equivalent to five milligrams of prednisone. And they really are interchangeable. The one downside I would say to a Medrol dose pack, and, and Greg, I should have taken pictures of a young woman I work with, a grad student who works with me, they think she had a type four sensitivity reaction to the booster, which I'm the one that gave it to her. Um, but anyhow, she had it three weeks ago. She does have autoimmune disease. She's very young, um, but it's the only thing we can figure out. She's not too miserable anymore, but she had those raccoon eyes, hives all you know around her eyes, hives all over her um, torso, et cetera. And the Medrol dose pack wasn't enough for her. So we had to do a much higher dose of prednisone, like 40 milligrams a day for several days, and then transition to, to a Medrol dose pack. And she's doing pretty well. 
And then on the next slide, we have that prednisolone. But I have a, um, I have a question for you here, yeah, sure. Trace. So yeah, this let's say this patient comes in right here that I just showed this, see if I can get this to work. This patient comes in, it's now, um, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon. I e-prescribe it, the patient picks this up. And, yeah. you know, this is day one here, right? They're taking six on the first Across day, the then five, and then four, or go, going yeah. this way. So yeah, here's, so going one, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. And they're kind of slowly weaning down, as you can see, losing a pill. I never know what to tell the patient, and I'm going to find out today, is I usually tell them just to wait to the morning to start it, because if it's three o'clock or if they can. So we want to get them this kind of dose throughout the day. So if they come in and it's, you know, two o'clock, they get to the pharmacy, it's three, three thirty, you know, how would you advise them? Obviously they're pretty miserable. I'd like for them to start something with like, what's the thoughts on that? How would you advise them? Yeah. And that's, I, whether or not the patient has a question, I always will tell the patient exactly what to do. And it's one of the most common issues that pops up, you know, with something like this. And you were exactly right. You want to get this in as soon as possible, believe it or not, it's actually written in the methylprednisolone dose pack. So on the back of that picture where the tablets are on the back, it tells you exactly what to do if you're starting later in the day, which is essentially you take all the tablets up to that point. So if it was like three or 3.30, the patient will have taken the first three, maybe four tablets, depending upon when they when they last ate. So you just you just play catch up. You take all the tablets you were supposed to take up until that point of the day, and then you'll take the one or two with your supper and then one at bedtime. So yeah, we don't want them to wait if possible. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Sure. Here's your um, uh, prednisone dose my, pack, my it looks like. Yeah, this this came out several years ago. It's prednisolone. And you know, prednisone, prednisolone are pretty much almost completely the same drug. I mean, Clearly, they're not entirely the same chemical, but pretty darn close. We have prednisolone as a chemical because it's the only one that could have been made into a liquid form that was somewhat palatable. That's why prednisolone exists. Why prednisolone had to be made into kind of a new type of dose pack, it's called the Millipred dose pack. Um, that's the brand name Millipred. It is exorbitantly expensive. Um, I had some, some practitioners, the, the reps must have gotten to them because I had some practitioners who started writing for the Millipred dose pack and insurance would just outright reject it. You could almost hear them laughing on the other side of the screen like, oh, are you kidding? Why would you choose this? I mean, even the dosing is the same. It's five milligrams of prednisone, five milligrams of prednisolone. So Unless somebody has samples, there's no reason to use the prednisolone dose pack. It's, you know, several hundred dollars. I think I've seen it as low as $375 now compared to four mil four dollars rather for the medral dose pack cost. So with these supply issues that, that are out there, um, we could just do five milligrams, 21 tablets, and just kind of have them take it the same way. Is that kind of is yeah. that kind of a way of doing it? Yep. If you wanted a quick taper, a six day taper, like a medrol dose pack or even a millipred, just use prednisone five milligrams and do exactly the same way. And, you know, I, we can even write the directions, you know, explain it to you how it's supposed to be written and help you write the directions if you don't know them off the top of your head. And it's great. Perfect. So did you talk about any adverse reactions with uh, with steroids? No, you know, for a medrol dose pack or a millipred dose pack or prednisone or whatever, you know, it's, you might have some acute changes for sure, particularly if a patient is um, a diabetic. So we want to make sure that we have them keep a closer eye on themselves if they're doing home glucose monitoring or they're wearing one of those Dexcom monitors that's on for, you know, a month um, that they use for a month, I should say. Some of them are 14 days, some of them are a month. Um, but loss of glycemic control can be tough. It's usually hyperglycemia, but occasionally you'll see hypoglycemia. We have drugs that interact with warfarin. Almost everything will interact with warfarin on some level. So we watch for that. And the biggest thing is just make sure they have food in their stomach. It doesn't have to be a Big Mac, but it shouldn't be just, you know, a water cracker. Um, that's not enough. We need something to separate the drug from the lining of the stomach. Think of prednisone, methylpred as like bacon frying in a pan, very similar to ibuprofen aspirin. If they take it on an empty stomach and it hits the lining of the actual stomach wall, it is kind of like bacon sizzling in a pan, which we don't want happening on the lining of our gut. 
long term, so, we get some pretty serious stuff. So what, you know, you say you don't have to go to a Big Mac, but you don't want to do so. Like, what would you just tell the patient to eat? What would, what would be a good, good pearl for us to, to know? Yeah, just, you know, I always say if you're having a, a meal, just have it with the meal. So with the Medrol dose pack in particular, that's what I say. I'm like, have it with your breakfast, have it with your lunch, you know, and it's a little uh, spread out, but that's the best way to do it. Otherwise, some yogurt is great, even milk, because uh, milk creates kind of a nice um, barrier, a, a salad, anything that's just going to create a layer between the drug and the lining of the stomach. I had one patient say to me that she took her steroid with um, a half half liter of water. And um, I thought about it for a second and I was like, eh, cause she's like, it'll float on the top of the puddle in my stomach. And I was thinking that's pretty good um, reasoning but water moves so quickly into um, the vasculature. I said, uh, it's probably not a smart idea because as soon as that puddle abates we're burning the lining of the stomach again. So you just want something that's bigger than a cracker, you know, that's going to kind of coat the area with it. And we don't have to worry about anything chelating with this, with this medication. Then, no. Correct. Right. Correct. Yeah. So yep. they can eat They're They're, they're free to eat whatever they want. Free to eat whatever they want. Perfect. So you can see here, you know, this was success here with this patient. You know, this was a patient that really didn't really ever identify what was going on. Sometimes we do, as we talk about those creams that are being used around the eyes, things that grow eyelashes and, you know, the glue from, you know, extension to, eye, to, to, to eyelashes, but uh, never really found out. But I just said, hey, look, you're having an allergic reaction to something. So we put her on you know, a Medrol dose pack, and you can see within a few days, she cleared up real nicely. So before, after, before with the eyes closed and after with the eyes closed, she was very, very. So I would advocate out there when you have these patients come in, I saw, you know, 50%, you know, haven't prescribed, maybe it's cause of state laws, but, you know, don't be afraid. These are short acting, um, nice kind of low dose. We're not hitting them with 60 milligrams and kind of weaning them down. This is, you know, kind of a nice little, uh, you know, you know, over a month time, we're doing it over a week's time here and it seems to work really, really well. So Tracy, before we move on to anything else, any other pearls that you want to give uh, with regarding steroids? No, I think, I think it's, it did a pretty good job. There was one question that just popped up in the chat regarding um, any eye surface issue at the same time. No, there wasn't. Uh, you know, if we go back to the, you know, the original pictures here, you know, her eye is pro too gone too fast here. Her eye was, you know, it looks a little red, but her eye was pretty quiet in a sense um, from like a, you know, like a, a marked injection. It was all kind of to the lid margin and to the outside. So the ocular surface was pretty, uh, pretty safe. Good question though. So as that question was rolling in and answering it, I did launch the poll. Joe, do you have any uh, comments? I know, you know, you're, you know, in a, you know, an educator, anything to steroids to uh, have you seen the central serous and e and being used? Well, you have to forgive me. I, I, I was enjoying a mental pina colada there. I was actually spent the last few minutes trying to get somebody in. So okay. I'm a little, little behind on the, on the conversation, right. but yes, uh, um, I have encountered cases where steroids were the culprit. And that is something that we have to fastidiously avoid. Yeah, I guess that's a good point. We talked about, it's kind of funny how we put these back to back. Is We talked about, you know, a treatment uh, for central serous and we followed up with using an oral steroid. But let's not forget what Dr. Saka is pointing out here is that one of the causes of central serous is, you know, oral steroids. So, uh, but I wouldn't be too worried about with a medical dose pack. It's more chronic long-term. All right, let me end the poll and uh, share the results. And um, here we go. You know, have you ever prescribed an oral narc for pain? Uh, about 20 or 18% said yes. Uh, does your state allow oral narcotics? And it looks like 63% are allowed. So about 40% now. So thank you for taking the poll, making this <clears throat> interactive. And let me move this out of the way. And so, you know, I'm going to start off here, Tracy and I put this to kind of together in a sense of, 
Um, let me show you where maybe we could be using these in ocular and then have Tracy throw some pharmaceutical pearls in here. So, you know, large corneal abrasions, corneal burns, ocular trauma, orbital blowout fracture, scleritis, or maybe times where you could use pain. This is a patient that came in or, or, or oral narcotics or, or some type of oral pain management, which we'll talk about how to use Tylenol and ibuprofen. But this is a patient that came in that was curling, using a curling iron, looked over to the side and, um, you know, to talk to a, you know, a spouse or a child. And basically this is well done epithelium right here. And you can see that it's pretty early in the stage, how white and quiet the eye is. There's hardly even time for inflammation to occur. They came in quickly and it's kind of neat that they didn't even slough off yet this epithelium. So that's how quickly they came in. But you can see this is just well done uh, epithelium. Actually pretty easy to treat. You can just, you know, debride it if you want, but you can just put a bandage contact lens over it and it just becomes more of a, an anti-inflammatory issue. Uh, that's out there. You know, I'm not sure how many bugs are surviving on a hot curling island, touching the eye. There is going to be an open wound. So, you know, an antibiotic steroid uh, combo and some oral medications to help control the pain for this patient. And this was a patient that came in that, you know, with Tracy and I do a narcotic lecture and we talk about, you know, watch out for the people that are trying to work you for you know, narcotics and being bullied and all that stuff. But, you know, it's, we also have to make sure that we use the medications. This person was using a razor blade, like a Zacto knife to, to do something and uh, kind of went right by their eye. And I'm like, all right, you know, they came in in a ton of pain and the pain just really wasn't matched when I was first looking. But if you look right here, and then I threw some stain in, you can see that there is a nice little, nice little cut right here. So I decided to pull out my OCT and the patient gave themselves a nice little arcane incision for lack of a better term with that exacto knife. So I decided to play around with the OCT a little bit and can kind of see here that it's about 600 microns and they went about 400. So then they had about 200 left for maybe about 190 um, before they entered into the anterior chamber. And don't forget that, you know, the cornea is the most innervated tissue of the body you know, right next door is a conjunctiva hardly any types of innervation but then when you get to the uh, to the cornea it's got tons and tons of uh, corneal nerves explaining now why this gentleman has so much pain uh, going you know two-thirds of the way through his cornea and I, I think that was about a four to six millimeter cut that he had uh, now explaining why he had uh, you know, a ton of pain going on. Here's another patient that came in. Uh, almost great, looks like a, great, great. Just a yeah. quick question, going back to the, that last one. Yeah. Did, did the patient's refract, refraction change at all? You know, I was following it and the answer was no. Um, you know, just it, luckily they didn't, you know, maybe they changed their, um, their, their topography in that area. But I think it's because they didn't have something matching on the other end to okay. kind of relax off. But yeah, I, I was going the same way, Joe. I was thinking the same thing, like, hey, that would be kind of neat. And could they build themselves for it? But, uh, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, they, uh, but they didn't have any change. So but it wouldn't have been neat if they would have had like some maybe with the rural astigmatism to see if that would have changed. Here's a patient that came in. And you can see there's a lot going on in here. You can see the injection right here. You can see where it's kind of pointing to where the problem is. You can see a high femur. You can see the pupil is misshaped. This guy, he was uh, working in the spring. It was in Pennsylvania, going from winter to spring, taking off the, you know, the winter tires, brakes, doing whatever they're doing. Everything's kind of rusted and corroded. And literally the screwdriver, that's a, this is the point of the screwdriver here, creating this kind of, in a sense, LASIK flap. But luckily, it only went about halfway through the cornea. I do have an OCT image on this, but not in this lecture. But the screwdriver kind of hit, as you can see, kind of, I don't know which, you know which eye is this, looks like the left eye, kind of nasal, and then went up into his orbit. And he had a nice little you know, conjunctival laceration as the screwdriver went underneath the eyelid and into the orbit up there and hit the orbit. And this would be a good place. And this was a guy that decided never to go back for his DSEC and he ended up with an endophthalmitis. So when we sent him back, he was in a lot of pain. We just gave him some, some oral 
uh, narcotics that are out there. And when it comes to you know, using medications like this, there's a couple of ways to remind, or you're not gonna turn this into a big narcotic lecture, but you know, when we talk about peripheral acting, like here in this little cartoon, it's showing aspirin acts out here, the peripheral acting, the NSAIDs uh, that work. And I always thought this was kind of neat. I like this picture, you know, when someone burns their hand, they pull it away pretty quickly. It doesn't have to go up to the brain. It, when certain fibers are triggered, it talks to the muscle and say, get your hand out. Then the pain comes. So I like that. So those fibers are pretty important out here to help us, you know, calm the pain, but also get our hand out of the harm. But then when we talk, start talking centrally, we're talking about these mu kappa and delta fibers that are really all kind of scattered throughout the body. So when we talk central acting, we're talking mu kappa delta, and you can see that, you know, that's why we get certain side effects and how they're scattered all throughout the body. Now, Tracy, you were the one that kind of taught me a little, a lot about, you know, mu, kappa, and delta. You know, is there anything you want to add before we hop in and start talking about some of these medications? Central versus peripheral. So when you look, you know, when you consider the receptors, you just have to keep in mind that there are the mu, kappa, delta receptors all over the body, um, which is what gives us the, the wonderful pain control when we use one of the uh, central acting agents, um, narcotic or narcotic-like, but it also gives us the laundry list of side effects, both acute and long-term. So a highly effective set of drugs, um, but, you know, with, with some baggage, you cannot separate the good from the bad, as I always say. That's a pretty good picture here on the bottom right with opioids in the body and all the little, little dots everywhere, you know, kind of showing that we have the, our pain receptors because uh, if something's going wrong, we need to know about it. And it's, it's a wonderful set of drugs when we need them, for sure. Now, Tracy, the mu receptor, if I recall, is the one that kind of gives us the, they all give us analgesic, but this is the one that kind of gives us that woohoo, that, that kind of high that's out there. Yes. So the, when the drug plugs into the, the mu receptors, it gives us definitely more of the, you know, woohoo, that euphoria that most people get when they take an opioid. It doesn't mean that you're an addict or whatever. It's just showing you, it gives you that, that sense of well-being, that sense of, of, you know, almost like a high. And that's also what in endorphins and dynorphins can do. These drugs mimic our own internal endorphins. So, um, you know, and there's been a lot of study going into um, whether or not we can enhance our endorphin responses, et cetera, and maybe change our pain threshold. You can see that there are fewer little pluses or stars under the kappa receptor. That does give us an analgesic potential as well, but nowhere near the same as the mu receptors. And Delta gives us a little bit. We've studied when can we use a drug that's just kind of plugging into Delta receptors because there are many fewer side effects if that would be the case. The problem is compared to the kappa and the mu receptors, it, it, its pain control is just not as good. We kind of need all three of them working together in most scenarios. And that's the kind of what we're showing over here in this picture. As you can see that this is pretty much dominated by the mu uh, yeah. anywhere throughout the body and then the delta and then you have or kappa, and then you have the delta. But the, you know, usually you'll see these narcotics that we talk about going to be coupled with usually, you know, acetaminophen and like something like hydrocodone. So that's kind of the synergistic effect that you get with these when we talk about this. But before we talk about that, this here is probably the narcotic that I use the most in practice. I kind of have these as Tramadol, then uh, we do have the hydrocodone fix in Pennsylvania, which is great because, you know, hydrocodone works great for eye pain. And then we can talk about, um, you know, the, the acetaminophen and ibuprofen combination. But, you know, tramadol is probably, if I'm going to reach for a narcotic, is, you know, 50 milligrams, you know, a couple times a day is usually enough to, for three or four days to get uh, the patient controlled. But, you know, I would be, you know, trying to make things up here if I thought I was the expert. That's why we have Tracy on here. Tracy, you want to talk about tramadol here? Yeah, tr tramadol is a great drug. And it's kind of a let's meet in the middle for our pain control, you know, no, nowhere near as potent or even as problematic side effect wise as a hydrocodone, but it's going to give you better pain control than than codeine, you know, or Tylenol with codeine. You can combine tramadol with um, ibuprofen type drugs or naproxen sodium 
and or acetaminophen for that matter. So you get that wonderful synergistic peripheral acting and central acting pain control. That's why that combination works so well. And the nice thing about tramadol is it, it is hitting the, the mu receptors, but it also um, increases serotonin and norepinephrine, which are you know, particularly serotonin, kind of some of our, our happy chemicals. So um, the, it's, a, it's a great drug in that regard. Very few side effects when you compare it to a true narcotic. Most people do not get drowsy on tramadol. Um, occasionally you hear someone that feels a little bit dizzy, but that's probably less because of the mu receptor uh, drug complex and more because of the serotonin and norepinephrine that's increasing. Um, we do have some drug interactions, but really only if the patient is taking two already on two drugs that are serotonergic. So two drugs that are increasing serotonin in the brain already. And that tends to be like our Prozac, Zoloft, Celexa, um, Lexapro type drugs, as well as maybe something for migraine, uh, what we call an abortive therapy for migraine. So our triptans, you know, Imitrex, Maxalt, that type of thing. But that, that combination is unusual. And again, like Greg was mentioning, even with the steroids um, and even a plerinone, you're using them a tramadol for a short period of time. So it's unlikely to be very problematic. They very friable disorder. And when I say friable, I mean that they are always just hanging on with bloody fingernails to control of their seizures. Tramadol probably wouldn't be a good drug in that type of patient, but that would be rare. That would be a rare situation. Used to not be controlled at all. And 2014, tramadol went to not controlled to a controlled substance, Schedule 4, at the same time that hydrocodone went from a Schedule 3 to a Schedule 2. Um, so there is some addiction potential, but more if you take it in super high doses and people use tramadol to um, not go through withdrawal when they can't get their hands on something better like oxycodone, hydrocodone, or heroin. So Tracy, you taught me that trick, you know, quite a few back. And I guess, you know, via this webinar, I'll just kind of you know, make myself feel a little bit better that, you know, I see a lot of patients coming in, they're taking Prozac, um, you know, they, they are, uh, you know, got ocular trauma to their eye, you know, I'm going to use, you know, 50 milligrams, one or two tablets a couple times a day for three or four days. Certainly okay, because it's just one because of the Prozac. You kind of taught me that pearl of looking for 10 to two of the serotonin. Still okay to kind of do that on that patient just for a few days. Absolutely. And the good news is too, it'll get caught on the pharmacy end if, if there's something that really, you know, is problematic, but yes, I would be completely comfortable with that scenario. And, you know, this is really you know, optometries, you know, you know, if, you know, if you're going to say narcotic or, you know, out there that you could be used because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very safe. It used to be a schedule five. It's now schedule four. It does have a little bit of, uh, of abuse potential. Do you, Tracy, do you see much uh, ultraset being used? And then, you know, my last pearl, while well, you answer that would be, you know, I would, you know, for ocular pain, for people that are out there listening, I would say, you know, don't use the extended release. You want to get something, you know, that's more for like maybe the chronic pink. Uh, oh, we lost pain you patient. for a second, Greg. Oh, am I back? Yep, you're back. Okay. So I was saying about the, I'm not sure I cut out, but uh, the tramadol, you know, and the, and the ultra set that's out there. Um, do you see that prescribed much? And then while you're answering that, I would just throw a little clinical pearl out there you know, tramadol extended release, you see it there. I would not use that for ocular pain for the fact that, um, you know, you want something that's quick. So stick with the all tram, not the extended release. And then, you know, do you see that much used with the, with the Tylenol, Tracy? We loathe the tramadol with uh, acetaminophen. It was completely a gimmick combo to get another brand name, i.e. Ultraset. Um, and the main reason is, is because the tramadol dose is 37.5 milligrams in the combination with acetaminophen, but it's 50 milligrams as just plain tramadol. So you get less drug with a combo. It makes much more sense to do the tramadol along with, you know, 325 or 500 milligrams of acetaminophen or even 650. You can get 650 milligrams of acetaminophen per tablet um, for acute pain. And I agree, the tramadol extended release really doesn't have much utility, but in a couple of scenarios where a patient has chronic pain and you don't wanna get them on Oxycontin you know, forever, 
then tramadol ER is, is a reasonable choice for chronic pain. Want to talk about the hydrocodone products? Sure. Yeah, we have the hydrocodone in here again because uh, quite a few states now have the hydrocodone exception or the hydrocodone fix um, because it went from a schedule three to a schedule two. So that was pretty much, you know, an, almost an automatic no in most states where optometrists could not prescribe schedule two narcotics. So many states have adopted the, hey, it's been schedule three forever. We like the drug occasionally. So you're able to use it. Um, I, I agree with the fact it went from schedule three to schedule two. I see many patients who have uh, addiction problems and some of them will flat say that they, that they prefer hydrocodone, the high they get from it as compared to other narcotics. So it can be problematic. Um, if you look on the slide, you can see kind of down towards the, the second half of the slide, there are different brand names for our hydrocodone combination products. And oh, by the way, for acute pain management, hydrocodone plus acetaminophen will be the only product that you um, should use. The hydrocodone does come in a product by itself, so not mixed with acetaminophen or ibuprofen for that matter, uh, but it is for chronic pain management. It's long acting for chronic pain. So you see Vicodin, you see Lortab, you see Norco. Um, all these products are pretty darn close to the same, except for there's a little wiggle room in the amount of acetaminophen that is in the combination per tablet. But it's a great drug and definitely more for moderate to severe, like moderate being on the like six end of the moderate. And what I mean by that is mild pain is one to three, moderate pain is four to six, and severe pain is considered seven to 10. So with moderate being four to six, hydrocodone would only really be a reasonable thing to choose for a day or two or three if the patient was a six on the scale. Anything less than a six on that pain scale, five, four, um, tramadol or, hydro, or a, rather codeine with acetaminophen would be more reasonable. So, you know, Tracy's referencing, you know, we've all been to hospitals and we've seen the kind of the pain scales up on the wall for the patients. You know, that's kind of a nice little clinical pearl. I really don't have those hanging in my optometry office, but you can Google pain scale and ask the patients, you know, hey, where are you on this pain scale so that I can, you know, prescribe this narcotic for you and put them documented in the chart. So we can use Dr. Google for that one. So, you know, pretty much in the practice, it's nice that hydrocodone came back um, that because, you know, between tramadol and using a little bit of you know, over-the-counter acetaminophen and then using Lortab or a medication in that category, I can usually pretty much treat all ocular pain. But before that in Pennsylvania, before we had that fix, you know, really it was either tramadol, codeine, and then ibuprofen and, uh, and, and Tylenol. Um, but you know, Tracy, you want to talk about the codeine tablets? Yeah. So this is kind of your third option for pain control. Um, as Greg alluded to earlier, you know, uh, I agree with him that tramadol is typically my, my favorite drug of these three. Um, codeine is great for, you know, kind of more low mild, uh, low moderate pain. I mean, anything less than a three on the scale, you, you could even easily cover with acetaminophen plus or minus ibuprofen. So keep that in mind. But once you get into more of the moderate pain control, you might want a combination of, you know, peripheral acting plus central acting. Codeine is a poor analgesic. It's a, well, a weak analgesic. Um, I said poor because you probably know the number one side effect um, of codeine is GI problems. So patient can get nauseated or vomit from codeine. That's why we see that codeine allergy pop up all the time. Codeine allergy that causes nausea, vomiting is not an allergy. It is just where the drug plugs into the receptors most profoundly. And that is in our barf center, which is right by the brainstem. So that's why, you know, more people are going to say they can't take codeine than any of the other narcotics because of that. So being a weak analgesic and more nausea and vomiting compared to tramadol or even hydrocodone, um, it's not my favorite, but it works for pain control. It's a schedule three. So codeine's a schedule three, hydrocodeine's a schedule two, and tramadol's a schedule four. Of this list, you see Tylenol number two, Tylenol number three, Tylenol number four. Tylenol number three is typically the one you're going to choose because every pharmacy has it. 
You might look at Tylenol number two that has a uh, half the concentration of codeine in it, 15 milligrams as compared to 30 or 60. The problem is you want this for acute pain management and most pharmacies do not carry on their shelf the Tylenol number two or Tylenol number four. So if you wanna have acute pain control acutely, then choose the Tylenol number three, which every pharmacy carries. And you just wanna make sure that you tell them not to add any additional acetaminophen when they're taking these combinations with hydrocodone plus acetaminophen, Vicodin type drugs, or the Tylenol number three. We just have to watch for that maximum daily dose of 3000 milligrams or so. And if you wanna be like really cool and you hear people talk about it, or if you're listening to like some shows on television, they call it T3. So yeah. you know, get Tylenol yeah. three, T3, right? To be real kind of cool and trendy. <laughs> So, you know, this is not really, you know, a narcotic, but, you know, this is been doing this for years, you know, teaching docs before we had narcotics in our states and so on and so forth, using the combination of ibuprofen and acetaminophen. And it actually shows that it can, that it can get to the level of morphine coverage. It just doesn't stay there as long as morphine. So when you're talking <clears throat> pain coverage, and you get to morphine and it's, you know, morphine's great at pain, morphine kind of stays at that level and then eventually drips down where ibuprofen and acetaminophen, this combination can get there, maybe hangs out for a little bit and then starts to come back down. But the key to knowing this is knowing your upper levels. And, you know, a few years back now, I guess it was maybe 2000, Tracy, you might remember 2016, 14, yeah. you know, we were allowed to give uh, acetaminophen at 4,000 milligrams a day, that changed. And now it's, they topped it off to 3,000 milligrams because of the liver toxicity. But you can see aspirin, you give up to 6,000 milligrams a day, but pretty much you just need to know ibuprofen, which comes in 200 milligrams over the counter. And so 16 of those you're allowed to give a day or four at a time. So the ibuprofen gives it the anti-inflammatory. There's no anti-inflammatory with acetaminophen, but you do have the analgesic. So if you give two Tylenol and two ibuprofen, as I'm pointing out right here, that gives you a pretty good analgesic coverage. If you want to go for ibuprofen, what that does is it gives you the analgesic plus the anti-inflammatory. So a lot of times these people have trauma to their eye. So we want to make, you know, I usually do four and two. I just be careful when I tell them four and two to make sure they don't get it reversed. I do like doing two and two because it's easy. Two out of the Advil bottle, two out of the Tylenol bottle. And the key here for when you tell patients to take it or if there's six pills, I mean, they look at it and they go, man, what's you know, Dr. Caldwell trying to do here? OD me. Don't forget that prescription strength ibuprofen is 800 milligrams. It can come in a big pill and you could take two Tylenol, maybe it makes them feel better if they're taking three, but you can just do this with things that are over the counter and at home. Uh, so, you know, four and two, two and two, I do a ton of that in the practice in controlling. I just be careful when I do four and two to make sure they're getting the four ibuprofen, not four Tylenol that are out there. Tracy, I know that you and I both wrote an article on this. Is there anything that you can add to this slide that I left out? Or is there anything we have to be careful with stomach linings and take it with food and all that fun stuff? Yeah, so Tylenol you can take with or without food, but it's always important to mention to the patient, um, you know, if they're picking up these OTC things, we may not see them as pharmacists, but aspirin, ibuprofen, naproxen sodium, they all need to be taken with food. We avoid the aspirin where possible. There's been a big push by Bayer to kind of remarket um, aspirin for pain rather than just the low dose aspirin for uh, prophylaxis against myocardial infarction and ischemic stroke. But we, we try to avoid the aspirin in the high doses just because there's more of an allergy potential because aspirin is completely from nature and um, rough on the stomach a little more than ibuprofen and naproxen sodium. And it can cause uh, tinnitus and other hearing changes because it plugs into um, more of the receptors in the, uh, the inner ear and the middle ear as well. So 
all that being said, um, some people like the naproxen sodium, the over-the-counter Aleve um, better. I tend to prefer ibuprofen over naproxen sodium just because you can take it four times per day, whereas naproxen sodium, maximally you can take it three, but even that's not quite as recommended. So if you want acute pain management, it's nice to be able to take things multiple times per day to treat acute pain. So that, that's you know just my kind of two cents there. Analgesic meds in pregnancy, uh, for the most part, narcotics are fine in pregnancy and um, Tylenol, acetaminophen is fine in pregnancy. You know, we, we like to say that pregnancy is a syndrome of symptoms. So, um, you know, I, I guess it's a little easier from a, you know, someone who was once twice a pregnant female saying to a pregnant female, you know, hey, you're going to have days where you feel poorly, et cetera, but we really don't want to use any meds if we can help it. Um, and that's, that's true. You know, from ocular pain perspective, sometimes you'll need it. Just keep in mind that the most, uh, the riskiest time for a pregnant woman to take drugs while pregnant is in that first trimester, because that's when the central nervous system is, is being rapidly formed. So the first 12 weeks or so, um, you, you know, are, are more at risk to have any potential teratogenic effect from the drugs. Um, and then I just saw, Greg, there was something that popped up in the chat about, uh, can you take two ibuprofen and two Tylenol how many times a day? You, you can theoretically take them both four times per day, depending upon how much acetaminophen you're taking. So what I mean by that is, let's say a patient is taking two 500 milligram acetaminophen along with the massive dose of ibuprofen. If a patient's doing that 500 milligrams times two, that's 1000 milligrams, they should only take that three times per day. So sometimes we even stagger the uh, non-steroidal with the acetaminophen. And in some patients, they say they like it better. And we've seen a lot of this in COVID treatment, you know, where patients need control for aches and pains and fever, et cetera. So it all depends, short answer is it all depends upon how much of a dose a patient is taking of the Tylenol. So if a patient is taking the 800 milligrams of ibuprofen and they're taking two of the regular strength acetaminophen, they're 325 each. So if they're taking 800 milligrams of ibuprofen plus 650 milligrams of acetaminophen, they can take them both four times per day. You just wanna watch that that dose of acetaminophen. And it goes back here. That's why I have these highlighted in red here. You know, if you subscribe to, you know, the recommendation now where it's 3000 daily, you know, for a chronic patient, I would say, look, you need to be at that 3000, but someone that comes in with eye pain and I'm only going to be using it for three or four times a day, as long as they're not a big drinker and have liver problems and so on and so forth. I will tell them, you know, look, the recommendation is, not to go over, you know, 3000. So if you take two 500, that's a thousand and do that three times a day, there you are, you're at your 3000. But if you add that fourth dose, now you're at 4,000, which was the old recommendation. So if I do four and two or, you know, four and two, that could be done four times a day if you're okay with exceeding that. If you're gonna do four and two of the 500, then you can, uh, you know, do it three times a day. And then if you're going to do, you know, of the four and two, if you're going to do 325, which is not the extra strength Tylenol, then, you know, you can get away with it. So it's just kind of know these upper doses, but don't forget, we're not treating things chronically. So we're right. kind of trying to control them quickly next few days until we get that eye pain controlled. So it's, you know, whatever you subscribe to here, it's going to be the Tylenol that limits you. Yeah, and, and you don't think for a second that when I'm having a bad rheumatoid arthritis day, you better believe I'm taking that 4,000 milligrams of acetaminophen plus the ibuprofen for a few days. And that's typically fine in most patients unless you you know have some liver issues you're worrying about. So Greg and I put in these pregnancy categories, they changed within the last few years. I don't wanna to spend too much time on them, but you'll see them in the ocular meds as well. Um, and that is that, you know, traditionally up until 2015, I lose track of time, 2014 was the final rule. Um, all drugs were A, B, C, D, or X. And C was the, the category that most came out in. And that was because category C basically says, 
animal studies show toxicity, human studies are inadequate, maybe there's a benefit. Um, that could be one of the things that a category C means, but it doesn't ever mean that because we don't do studies in pregnant women. So it always means a category C drug when it comes out that we have no idea whether or not it's a teratogenic potential. So, um, you know, unless it's a drug that ha has already been known to be a teratogen in, in other types of drugs that are similar, like a cancer chemotherapeutic drug is always going to be a category X, et cetera. So because these were kind of difficult to understand, it didn't include breastfeeding women, the FDA completely revamped over several years the um, the categories for pregnancy and lactation. So now you can see on this slide, uh, as of 2015, summer of 2015, pregnancy is always the section 8.1 in drug labeling. And it shows if there's anybody in a pregnancy uh, exposure risk category. So people, I always say people that are on the show, I didn't know I was pregnant until I gave birth in the target you know, target aisle. Um, we try to accumulate information from these patients and say, were you taking any medication? And then you can evaluate that with how, you know, how the infant is health-wise. Um, and then there's always clinical considerations that they include. So it's all the data that we have from people who took meds while they were pregnant, it, advertently or inadvertently, and we've compiled it, you know, and that's what the FDA is showing us. Now we have lactation data as well in 8.2, and then section 8.3 is showing you whether or not there are some potential fertility issues associated with the drug. So for instance, on the next slide, Greg, uh, for the 8.3, we can't really see it here, um, interesting, that drug that just got the emergency use authorization, the Merck drug for COVID, the molnupiravir, um, that has some serious section 8.3 questions in terms of whether or not it can cause mutagenesis in, um, you know, dividing cells. So, uh, or even in, um, you know, the sperm of a male. So the studies for molnupiravir, uh, and what will be out in their sections here when it's uh, FDA approved, if it gets FDA full approval, we'll have a lot of information regarding how to avoid it in certain scenarios. So in this example here, this is, you know, before June um, 30th, Valtrex was approved. And what I'm showing here is they did update their, their, their package insert. And you can see here, it says category B. So Valtrex is category B, safe to give to someone that's pregnant, but you can see they're kind of doing a hybrid. You still find it under 8.1. And then if you go to 8.2, you don't really see anything because they don't have any data on lactation. They're allowed to leave it off, but you can see they do have some information on, on nursing mothers. Now that's a hybrid because that medication was out before June 15th. Now you can see here, I just grabbed something that came out here recently. This is up meek. And you can jump down here again if you want to know you pregnancy. It's just going to say there's no clinical data uh, on file. Well, this is actually showing Zydra here, and then here you can see lactation, but they don't have anything under for for the nursing mothers or the reproduction. So the key is I just wanted to bring it out is you're gonna you know we're used to those who are you know senior on this. We're used to kind of that A B C D and X. This has kind of changed now to new medications. You have to go to 8.1, 8.2, 8 8.3, but don't think that, you know, that, hey, where's 8.2 or where's 8.3? They're allowed to leave it off if there's no data to report. And I guess yeah, this here, go ahead. I'm sorry, Greg. All the new drugs that are coming out will not have A, B, C, D, and X. They're only going to have the 8.1, 8.2, 8.3. Older drugs may, you know, will likely have both stay. Yeah, so it's at that June 15th, uh, that June 30th of 15. If they're out before, you're going to see the combo. And if it's out after, you're just going to see 8.1, 2, and 3, right? Is that, do we say that correctly? Yep. Perfect. All right, let's jump out of uh, that and let's move into some antibiotics. And, you know, here's, I'm going to launch this question here is that you have this patient show up with this dacryocystitis. They have a severe allergic penicillin and Keflex type. It's an EpiPen reaction. You know, they're, they're, they're swelling, their heart. It's just, just an, uh, you know, an anaphylactic type of reaction. Which antibiotic would you use for this dacryocystitis if they're allergic to penicillin and Keflex? Would you use Augmentin? Would you use uh, azithromycin? 
Keflex, Bactrim, or Cipro? Getting some nice answers rolling in. All right, let's see. got a question here. Which is worse for the liver, acetaminophen or ibuprofen? So, Tracy, correct me if I'm wrong. Acetaminophen is going to be the worst because it's cleared through the liver, and ibuprofen is cleared through the kidneys. And we have to be careful with patients that are diabetic and using ibuprofen because I believe it's the kidneys and then acetaminophen is liver. But Tracy, you can validate or clarify that for me. That is correct. And 30 years ago when I was a student, I remembered because they're opposite. Acetaminophen is liver, ibuprofen is kidneys. And I remembered this as a student. Now you will forever remember this too. I used to call it ibuprofen. So if, you know, kidneys make you pee. So that would also help me remember. I remembered acetaminophen was the opposite. So Tylenol, acetaminophen is liver, ibuprofen is kidney. Thank you for that question. So I'm going to have filled in the dead space while we were running the poll. So I'm going to end the poll and uh, put up here, share the results. So we have 10% or 11% saying augmentin. Azithromycin is looks like the winner. And then we have Keflex at 10% and Bactrim and then uh, Cipro. So I want to stop sharing that. You're going to see that polling question again because we're going to go through um, the the next few slides here and then we'll see if you're uh if you're change if so see if that will change at all so this was the antibiotic paradigm that i had in eye care in two up through 2019 i had penicillin as augmentin and azithromax as or my macrolide being azithromax moving down into if i couldn't use either two both of those then i'd move into the cephalosporin being keflex Cipro and then Bactrim. Well, that changed in 2020 when Tracy and I started talking about this because the quinolones just had a lot of just adverse drug effects. So we just kind of slid it down and moved sulfa back up. So nothing really has changed here with regarding whenever I'm prescribing an antibiotic in the practice, we have, you know, I, I go for Augmentin or Zithromax kind of as my go-to. And really, if they're allergic to penicillin, then I go to the macrolide. And if they're allergic to the macrolide, then I go to the penicillin. And then you'll see as we go through and talk about a few of these, there's things to remember. Um, Tracy, how many generations of cephalosporins are there now? I don't even, I forget the last number you told me. Five. There's five generations of, of cephalosporin. You know, sulfa, again, used to be the last line, but because of all the side effects, we kind of moved it up to, to Bactrim. It's a great medication. It just, you know, it's up to care for that sulfur allergy, which I'll have Tracy talk about. So, you know, we have cross reactions, you know, there's about a 10% cross reaction with the first generation cephalosporins. And then we have, you know, some cross reactions, you know, with the sulfa. And Tracy, I have this coming up in a later slide. So we're going to kind of hammer on this because, you know, how can I give Azop to someone that comes in with a sulfur allergy and maybe they're supposed to react, but they never do. So we'll have that coming up when we talk about sulfas. Um, but so we'll kind of move into the, to the augmentin here. And uh, this is kind of my drug of choice to go with, but you know, we have Tracy on the, on the, on the, on the webinar here today. So Tracy, why don't you talk about amoxicillin? Maybe the first time you were like, Greg, what are you using amoxicillin or uh, augmentin for uh, when it came to eye care? Yeah, that's probably exactly what I said too. Um, so, you know, generally when we're looking at, you know, upper respiratory type infections, which, you know, sinusitis, um, otitis media, that type of thing, you know, I, I'm not an optometrist and I certainly knew a lot less about it when he and I first started um, lecturing together. So um, I questioned it because, you know, in, in patients who don't have chronic infections, upper respiratory, like otitis media, acute sinusitis, et cetera, we always like to try to go to amoxicillin first because because it gives you decent coverage against Haemophilus influenza and Streptococcus pneumoniae, which are the most common organisms in those infections. So then you move to Dacryocystitis, where the organisms can be the same type, 
but there's definitely, you know, a little bit more of a leaning towards um, the Haemophilus influenza having a bit of a resistance problem. You get that, that gooey exudate um, that you sometimes see. Amoxicillin by itself is generally not going to be enough. So we need uber amoxicillin or, you know, amoxicillin with the crispy candy coating, new and improved amoxicillin, whatever you want to call it. And that's by the addition of that clavulonic acid or clavulonate. It's augmented amoxicillin, but it's still amoxicillin. It's literally just amoxicillin that has uh, an enzyme inhibitor added to it, which helps give us more coverage in resistant kind of atypical organisms like H flu. So it's a great drug. It's so well tolerated. You can use it in newborns. You can use it in the oldest of our adult patients, um, safe in pregnancy as well. So it's just a great drug all around. Yeah, my, my two cents to that is if we all remember that, you know, uh, penicillin has that beta lactam ring and these pus producing, which is what we see around the eye, these pus producing, produce that beta lactamase, which cleaves it and makes it. And then this, this clavironic acid just has a higher affinity for that, for that beta lactamase, which then allows it to kind of, in a sense, sneak in the back door and destroy that bug that's out there. So that's why I like to use, if I'm going to do... It's typically, Tracy, I do 500 milligrams twice a day. If I yeah. have, um, you know, I, I guess, you know, I get these, these kids that come in that are linebackers and, you know, they're 16 years old and twice as big as me and muscular, you know, 875. Do you have any recommendations on the twice a day, 250, 500, 875? Yeah, the 250, we don't use much anymore. Occasionally you see that for like a dental, mild, you know, dental prophylactic type scenario, but generally we're using the 500 or the 875. And, you know, we, we sometimes see that we've gotten in the habit of dosing it actually based on body weight, but the truth of the matter is we're, we should be dosing it based on um, the severity of the infection slash severity of the organism causing the infection. So if one is a little bit harder to treat. So in higher um, 875 twice a day or um, sinusitis, we see that um, even in strep throat, which is strep pyogenes, group A beta hemolytic strep, but that's getting tougher and tougher to treat because we so overuse azithromycin. Zovarax. So the short answer is 500 milligrams twice a day, occasionally 875. And you don't really need to worry about that based on body weight. We all are only going to dose it on body weight for kids. Like okay. that's, that's, a, that's a great pearl. So yeah, you know, get a, someone that comes in with a real nasty eye infection and uh, maybe they're lighter in pounds, you know, a, a yeah. hundred, a hundred pound female, I'm going to go 875. So that's a good pearl to, gotcha. to kind of know. So perfect. You know, so this is a good way to wrap this up is that, you know, I love augmenting it's penicillin. The only thing I have to really remember is that penicillin allergies, as Tracy said, good for kids, good for geriatrics, gram positive, gram negatives. It's good for pregnancy. It's good for everyone unless they're allergic to it. And if they're allergic to it, then we move into uh, azithromycin that's out here, which it would be known as the ZPAC, drug of choice for penicillin sensitive patients. Tracy, you want to talk about a ZPAC here or maybe the TRIPAC? Yeah, TriPAC is available as well. The only difference between the, the Z-Pack, you know, it's a five-day course. You take 500 day one and then 250, 250, 250, 250 milligrams. The TriPAC is three days in a row of 500 milligrams. I think the, the three-day TriPAC um, kind of has gotten a little bit of short shrift because it came out after the Z-Pack and the Z-Pack just took off. I call it vitamin Z because so many people use it for, you know, oh, I have the sniffles. I must need an antibiotic. And that has has perpetuated resistance of bacteria for years now. Um, but the nice thing about both of these is, you know, you can treat community acquired pneumonia with a Z-Pack. It's only five days, but the drug stays in the bloodstream for up to 10 days. So that's the one major nice thing about azithromycin. Um, and I, I said that exactly how I wanted to, because I, I sometimes have a frenemy relationship with this drug just because it's, it's just so overused, but in a dacryocystitis scenario where a patient has a suspected or confirmed allergy that could be severe to our penicillins or cephalosporins, this is a great drug. And I, I think even the, the tripack would work. It's just that, you know, most people go to that Z-Pack the five days in a row, which is 
which is great. It's well tolerated. It's fine in pregnancy. It's fine in the littlest of children, um, you know, and our old oldest adults. So it's a good drug. So we have these eye infections that come in like this nasty dacryo cystitis that I'm showing here. I put them on, you know, a five day Z pack. They come in, it's day six or seven. You can still kind of see that it's kind of smoldering there. Maybe they're going to need maybe a second dose. Do I wait 10 days since this lasts in the body 10 days? No, you could just, you know, do another Z pack right after it. Um, in some of those scenarios, I would suspect that it maybe is more of a strep pneumo causing the smoldering rather than the hemophilus. So, you know, I said, and, and you mentioned as well, I think that, you know, we're looking at typically hemophilus influenza gram negative or streptococcus pneumoniae gram positive. Amoxicillin plus clavulonic acid covers both of those pretty well. So you're going to get coverage from that combination. When we move to azithromycin, particularly if we're doing it, you know, if the patient has an allergy to our penicillins or cephalosporins that we're worried could be severe, we lose a lot of our good strep pneumo coverage here. So azithromycin is definitely more of the atypical or gram negative organisms like that H flu, maybe like 75% more of the gram negative and just maybe 20, 25% of the gram positive. So I'm thinking if they're still smoldering at day six, that maybe we need to switch our coverage. So, you know, I'm trying to build these paradigms for, you know, for, for colleagues out there. That's why Augmentin is kind of number one in my book. If we're going to be trying to treat these, trying to hit them, trying to get them off and trying to fix the infection, you know, that's, kind of, okay, what do I do if the patient is allergic, try to make the algorithm a little bit easier. It's the, you know, Z-pack, but you got to also, by doing that, moving into the second position, you're losing a little bit of coverage. Yeah. So if they just don't resolve as quickly as you would think, then maybe consider something like, all right, day six, seven, they're still smoldering. Maybe they're a little improved. Then you, then you consider something like Bactrim. There you go which we're going to talk about here shortly. I'm going to go through this pretty quick. This is just a little cutesy thing to kind of remind us that, you know, if you have someone with chlamydia conjunctivitis or chlamydia, it's one gram, four pills, 250 once a day, you know, drug of choice. If everything's supposed to stay in Vegas, that happens in Vegas. You know, you take your one gram of azithromycin, you know, take your four pills, your bottle of water as you leave the Bellagio here. And as you head out to the McCarran airport or and uh, just take it and it should have everything neutralized by the time you land back to where you're flying to. <laughs> but, uh, you know, kind of a cutesy little way to try to remember that. But, uh, you know, now we're going to move into kind of the, uh, the third realm here of the antibiotics, which is, you know, Keflex and, and uh, uh, Cephalexin uh, that's out here and, you know, start getting some limitations, but it's still a good third position. Maybe Salt will move up to that third someday. But Trace, you want to talk about these two medications that uh, we're going to talk about in the cephalosporins, even though there's five generations? Yeah. So, you know, Greg and I wanted to make sure that we kind of hit everything that might pop up as a potential. There are some practitioners, optometric and otherwise, that learned that cephalexin is the drug of choice, uh, first generation cephalosporin. Uh, for treatment of dacryocystitis. And I don't have a big problem with that. It is um, compared to amoxicillin, cephalosporin has coverage more similar to Augmentin. You know, it's broader coverage, um, but it's also, you know, a very well tolerated drug. Interestingly, most people think cephalexin and they start um, thinking that it's, you know, oh, it, it's more of a skin and soft tissue type drug for infections there, but the, their drug doesn't know what it's treating. If it gets to the site, it can do the job. So very well tolerated, okay in pregnancy. And if some people react to penicillin, as long as it's not life-threatening and you don't want to use that penicillin, go to a cephalosporin like cephalexin. It's a great choice, um, wonderful choice. There was a question that just popped up, Greg, as you move to the next cephalosporin slide. Um, oh yeah, Greg got it. One gram is one dose for the uh, chlamydia eye infections. Here we have cefuroxime, ceftin. I actually had three calls for this yesterday. Two of them were for eye infections from an optometrist that I'm friendly with. Um, 
so the cefuroxime ceftin is a second generation cephalosporin. It gives you a little bit more of the gram negative coverage, which is what I have here, better for the H flu. That's a gram negative organism. So this would even be something reasonable, Greg, as long as we're not dealing with an allergy. Let's say the patient um, got the azithromycin for whatever reason, because they had a penicillin allergy, but the allergy wasn't potentially life-threatening. The lower uh, or the farther we go with our cephalosporins, the lower the likelihood of there being a cross reaction with allergies. Let me say that again. Let's say a patient had a, you know, states penicillin allergic. So you gave them azithromycin for their dacryocystitis. It came back on that day six or seven. It was still kind of smoldering. You talked to them more about their penicillin allergy and they said, oh, well, when I was a, a kid, my mom said I got a tiny little rash from it. Well, that rat reaction of uh, being a true serious allergy is not likely, but maybe you don't want to risk it. So then go to something like a cephalosporin, cephalexin or cefuroxine, and you know, you're going to get a little better coverage then for that smoldering infection. This definitely isn't quite as popular as cephalexin, um, more for upper respiratory tract infections, but it's available. So don't, don't forget about it if you need it. And it's a category B uh, that's so it's safe for pregnancy that's out there. And, you know, this is kind of a little reminder here. This is penicillin. This is the this molecular structure. Here's Keflex. And you can see that they look similar. So if you're going to have an allergic reaction, um, that's why you get that 10% cross reaction. But you can see here the molecular structure left and starts to change. And that kind of just echoes what just Tracy just said. If they're allergic to penicillin, and you go to azithromycin and they're smoldering, all right, if you want to avoid and be safe, avoid Keflex, go ahead down to septin because the molecule looks totally different. And as Greg's moving across here, I just want to make one quick comment. I'll make it really fast. Okay. So penicillin allergy, the cross-reaction with a cephalosporin, Greg mentioned, you know, potential cross-reaction 10%. That's true. It's, it's an estimate, but that's a pretty solid number. But also keep in mind that 90% of people who say that they're allergic to penicillin, 90% say who say they're allergic to penicillin are not allergic to penicillin at all. So we're playing the numbers, but you just have to, uh, you know, ask the right questions. What happens when you take this drug and kind of, you know, make your decision that way. So sulfa drugs, Chase, you want to just talk about sulfa drugs? Yeah, so Bactrim, you know, comes a single strength or double strength. Nobody uses a single strength anymore. Very rarely, like if patients have chronic urinary tract infections, you might see somebody occasionally taking a single strength um, uh, concentration once per day. But otherwise, everybody uses the Bactrim DS, which just means double strength. It's 800 milligrams of the sulfamethoxazole, 160 of the trimethoprim. It's a twice a day drug. Um, you know, it kind of has fallen out of favor because everybody worries about the sulfa allergy, which is a problem. If someone has a sulfa allergy, we do not use this drug because that's not like penicillin. It's just how the body reacts. The sulfa allergy, you just say, okay, I'll write it down and you believe them. Um, but it, this is a great drug. It's so well tolerated as long as there's no allergy and it gives you great coverage for um, the strep pneumo and even the hemophilus. I like it much better than our oral floral quinolones, much, much, much better. We have a couple of adverse drug reactions. And again, these are immune mediated skin reactions uh, or uh, immune based diseases like sickle cell disease or, or familial, I should say. Um, Stevens Johnson syndrome, and it says high incidence of SJS and toxic or uh, toxic epidermal necrolysis rather. Um, that's just when you're comparing it to other medications. We have a few that can cause the Stevens Johnson syndrome and toxic e epidermal necrolysis, but it's a very low chance when you just look at the drug individually. When you compare it to other drugs, it's got the higher likelihood, but very, very well tolerated. Now, Greg mentioned this earlier, the cross-reaction with other sulfa moiety agents, and that just means other drugs that have a sulfa ring. The way that we kind of um, determine whether or not a patient, let's say they come up with a sulfa allergy, and you're trying to determine whether or not you can you know, give them a prescription for Celebrex for pain management, or um, what was the example, the exact one that you used, Greg, earlier for how can yeah, we Yeah, there's a, you know, in glaucoma, you know, you have these patients yeah. come in and they have a sulfur allergy and you want to use a carbonic anhydrase and hydrase and hyper topical. Right. Um, 
So dorzolamide or, you know, Azop, something along that line. I think, yeah, I think you had said Azops to begin with. I was trying to stick with the exact um, example. There, there really is a very, very, very low chance of cross-reactivity um, because we know, and this has been studied a lot, that if somebody has an antibiotic sulfa allergy, which most people do, they've had Bactrim and they reacted to it we know that they are unlikely to react to non-antibiotic sulfa-based drugs. I know that sounds sketchy just to say that out loud, but we have a lot of data to support this. So if somebody reacted to a sulfa antibiotic, i.e. Bactrim, then um, they are unlikely to have a problem, particularly when you give it topically for a non-antibiotic sulfa-based agent, because there's more to it than just the sulfa moiety. So I have no fundamental problem. I mean, if somebody said, just so you know, I was clinging to life when I took this drug, I would probably say to that optometrist for a patient who was clinging to life on Bactrim, can you pick a different drug than a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor topically for this patient? But if they said, nope, there's nothing else, I want this drug, then the patient's likely you know, gonna be fine. We're, we're comfortable with those recommendations. So Tracy, Sally, that, that's always a great point. I love whenever we go over this because it helps clarify a ton out there. So if they're allergic to the antibiotic, then you know it's okay to give it a shot unless they're clinging to life. But in this case down here, obviously, if they're allergic to carbonic and hydrase inhibitors, then obviously we would avoid it. But what about Celebrex? They come in, I know it's got that sulfa kind of amoyity. Does Do we want to maybe stay away from it because they're probably going to react? You mean if they say they have a sulfa allergy, can you give them Celebrex? No, they come in, they don't have a, say, a, they don't know if they're allergic to sulfa drugs because they never okay. took it. But they took Celebrex and had a, you know, an allergic reaction. Would I avoid the Azop? So meaning that it's oh. not the sulfa loyalty type of antibiotic, but it's right. the, you know where I'm going? Yeah, I know exactly. So we're not saying they have an allergy to an antibiotic, uh, the antibiotic sulfa. Greg is saying they had an allergy to Celebrex. Is it okay to um, give the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor? And believe it or not, in a lot of cases, it is okay, but generally it's going to pop up as a problem. So I would say if they have a Celecoxib, a Celebrex allergy, and they've never had Bactrim, so you don't know if they react to that, can you give them a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor? I would try to steer clear of it, you know, based upon the small amount of that type of um, information that we have, the data. So that's the clinical pearl I wanted to kind of point out. If they come in and they have a true antibiotic, I will still give the Azop. But yeah. if they're starting to have issues within this kind of, you know, non-antibiotic sulfa, then I try to avoid it. So that's yeah, just kind exactly. of the problem. Antibiotic allergy versus non-antibiotic, you kind of stick with those categories. So here's Cipro, kind of the last line uh, of, of defense here that's out there. Tracy, you want to talk about Cipro? Yeah, so we, we have the two of them there, Ciprofloxacin and Levofloxacin as just kind of the representatives, as kind of the two ends of the spectrum for our fluoroquinolones. Ciprofloxacin gets a lot of mileage as an ocular medication. I love Ciprofloxacin ocular when needed because it's mostly gram negative with a little bit of gram positive thrown in. Ciprofloxacin used to be a wonderful drug for gram positive infections systemically as well. And it has been so overused that resistance is rampant with ciprofloxacin. So with that being the theme, we've tried very hard to avoid using our levofloxacin, our moxifloxacin, our gemifloxacin, um, to very serious infections when possible. So that's another reason why they've kind of been plutoed to after our Bactrim sulfa type drugs. So with all that being said, if you need gram positive coverage and you need absolutely a quinolone because the patient's allergic to penicillins, they're allergic to the macrolides like azithromycin and they're allergic to sulfa and you will see patients like this pop up, um, then we might only be left with an oral fluoroquinolone uh, if you want systemic. And if you have a typical dacryocystitis type infection, we're worrying about those organisms, you're going to have to use the levofloxacin systemically because it gives you that better coverage for those organisms. But we have lots of side effects to worry about with these drugs. Um, you know, people have kind of this, I don't even want to call it idiosyncratic because it's not really that anymore. People have some sort of 
reaction and allergic, I'm doing air quotes around allergic, reaction to our macrolides where they can end up with per permanent peripheral neuropathy after a couple of doses or tendinitis, tendon rupture. Um, they, can, they can cause QT prolongation. So if somebody uh, has the propensity for an arrhythmia in the action potential, that's what a QT or a QTC prolongation means. And most people don't live to tell the tale. So it's supposed to be a little bit of scare tactics uh, because I want everybody to understand that our fluoroquinolones are fantastic. They get the job done, but in many cases, it's like killing a fruit fly with a sledgehammer. It's too big, it's too broad. There's too much baggage that goes along with these agents. So we wanna try to avoid them if we can. There's also a question about potential for uh, retinal detachment with the oral agents. I don't think it's a huge issue, but Greg can make a comment on um, his thoughts regarding even topical fluoroquinolones with retinal detachment. Yeah, it's kind of all over the place that's out there. And yeah. there's been some loose literature. Just, just be aware that, you know, you might hear that talked about, uh, you know, maybe if you're injecting it into the vitreous and it has a certain type of collagen that's in there, it might lead to a retinal detachment, but topicals, I think you're totally fine with orals maybe, and then injecting it. Just be aware that there's some loose association of that that's out there. So with that being said, I want to see if this changed anything that's out there. So you have this patient with a severe allergic reaction now to, um, you know, penicillin and, and, and Keflex, you know, which antibiotic would you avoid uh, that's out there? So uh, it looks like everyone's in a sense, uh, somewhat paying attention because they're rolling in nicely here. So you have the severe allergic reaction, anaphylactic penicillin and Keflex. You know, we which which medication would you reach for in treating this dacryocystitis? And then Trace, I'm gonna go through the next one pretty quickly. Maybe hit the... Uh, uh, the antivirals. I'm not sure if you want to talk about the vaccine stuff, which I added towards the end, but we're going to hit our ceiling of, of expiring yeah. our time. So we can zip through maybe some of the antifungals and then, because that's quick. Okay. So I'm going to end this poll. Maybe I'll stop the other polls and not do them, but uh, I'll share this real quick. I liked what happened here. You know, a lot of people were paying attention and so on and so forth. Obviously, you want to avoid augmentin if they have a severe allergic reaction because uh, the penicillin. You could use the cephalexin if you want. Uh, just be careful with it. But again, jumping toward the azithromycin, I see Bactrim and then being a good choice. And then Cipro is a, is a choice, but we typically want to try to avoid those two uh, that are out there. It would work, but uh, we want to try to avoid all right, so let's see here. So what are we missing? We're missing, uh, you know, the tetracycline group. You know, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly here and just walk, you know, maybe take two or three minutes just to remind everyone, you know, doxycycline and minocycline, they're antibiotics, but in the case that we're using it for meibomian gland dysfunction, as in this gentleman here with, you know, rosacea and this marginal foam and inspissated meibomian glands and, you know, a marginal ulcer, our body produces staph aureus and staph, or our body has staph aureus and staph epidermis that live on the eyelids. So they produce lipase. Lipase breaks down lipid. That's what's in the meibomian gland. And then as you break down that lipid, that's what creates the inspissated meibomian gland. Now, we know that fat being lipid and an enzyme like lye and lots of tears on the eye, fat, water, and lye um, can turn into soap. And that's what this truly is. That's why people's eyes burn. Then you break down the lipid into phospholipids and you start getting into the arachidonic cycle and the, and the arachidonic acid. That's when we get prostaglandins, thromboxanes, and leukotrienes. And that's why we get red, swollen, and thickened lid margins because these are all mediators of inflammation. So I think we're all used to using, you know, like Toberdex on this but Tobradex only works in this part of the cycle. Wouldn't it be really cool if we had something that could work on lipase? And that's exactly what minocycline and doxycycline do. They work, that's why it's the drug of choice for meibomian gland dysfunction. It works on that lipase enzyme. I have it used here as an antibiotic small. I am treating someone with Lyme disease. 
came up with it'll be a fun case to present at some point, but we're using it more for its anti-inflammatory at the higher doses. So minocycline, doxycycline, higher dose is more of an antibiotic at a lower dose. It's more of a steroid. And I might just said that backwards. Let me just clarify that at the higher dose, 100 milligrams twice a day, antibiotic. Lower dose, we're using it as a steroid. Uh, we can use it at high dose to kind of pulse them and then bring them down like we would a steroid to treat that meibomian gland that's out there. So with all these new devices that are out there, I still use uh, uh, minocycline and doxycycline to treat that meibomian gland, and we can successfully treat a lot of the meibomian gland dysfunction that's out there um, without having to go into some really uh, expensive, you know, tools that are out there, unless you're a dry eye expert, then I would say go for it and, and absolutely do that and assist with the doxycycline and minocycline. We usually get this question a lot about hyclate versus monohydrate. You know, they always, you know, which one should we use? Which one should we not use? And here's my kind of take, and I'll let Tracy throw in her two cents. All of these are vodka drinks. Some people like it with a little bit of coffee. Some people like it with some orange juice and some people like it with ginger beer. But the key here is that it's the vodka. The key here, it's the minocycline, it's the doxycycline and it's the way it's being delivered. The high clate versus the mon monohydrate really doesn't affect. It's just whether you're getting your vodka through orange juice or through gin or through a vodka tonic that's out there. So it's more the delivery system that's out there when it comes. So it doesn't really matter high clate versus monohydrate. But Tracy, can you throw any clarity into that? Yeah, it, it really doesn't matter. You know, um, initially we thought that there was an absorption difference between the two um, with monohydrate potentially being uh, better. And you may be able to find some information that you see some very small differences in that there have been a lot of uh, kind of new sexy pharmaceuticals that have come out in the dermatology arena in particular with very expensive aracia, adoxa, et cetera. I mean, you know, $1,000 a month for a doxycycline type drug that was supposed to have better absorption, but in general, it doesn't matter. So right now you can get the high clate very, uh, very easily. It's the least expensive of all of them. With electronic prescribing, you do have to pick. So um, most people are just going to pick doxycycline high clate in the e-prescribe. And you can even put in the notes, if high clate not available, okay to substitute monohydrate, something like that, because it just doesn't matter. They're both fantastic. And just be aware that doxycycline, I'm not going to go through this. I'll just kind of remind everyone, they do have some side effects that are out there. You know, light sensitivity, uh, can create some uh, optic nerve head swelling. Uh, it's, it's more of an uh, a, a intracranial hypertension. It's not idiopathic as we'd say, because we do know that it's secondary to the doxycycline or minocycline. I usually get these about one a quarter kind of roll in. We have to roll out the, you know, the causes of bilateral papilledema, but it's usually at that point, everything's ruled out. We stop the minocycline or doxy and the optic nerve head returns back uh, to normal. And again, this is just a reminder that it can happen. And I usually post them out there somewhere to remind people that it can happen with this medication. The hyperpigmentation, I did this to this lady. Uh, she had this pigmented um, uh, to, her, to her feet and we stopped it. And you can see over six months she faded. And I was actually treating her meibomian gland dysfunction. There's a little bit longer to the story about Everyone was trying to scratch her head and she came in and she said, uh, hey, look, this is what's changed. And I said, hey, I did this to you. But she did fade over time and there's what she looked originally. So be a reminder that these medications can create hyperpigmentation. You wanna talk about your antifungals, Trace? Yeah, so uh, we you know, have reworked this lecture quite a bit and um, we decided to add some of our oral antifungals or systemic antifungal agents because certainly you use them and you may have prescribing privileges in your state for some of these. Uh, the majority of the second, third generation um, oral antifungals are very well tolerated and they're broken down uh, based on structure. So you can see we have under the azole class, we have imid imidazoles, which is ketoconazole, myconazole, clotrimazole, and then our triazoles, itraconazole, fluconazole, voriconazole, and posaconazole. 
So you can tell by their names that they are all azole antifungals. So how the heck do you weed through these agents or, or anybody? How do you read through them and weed through them and figure out what to use? We kind of break them down based upon um, what antifungal coverage they have. Um, in general, they're all very broad, well-respected uh, well agents, some better tolerated than others, some have more side effect or excuse me, uh, drug interactions compared to the others. And that's what this last little uh, bullet says there with the eyeglass, pharmacokinetics and dynamic differences. Um, all the agents have different um, liver, enzyme drug interactions. So I'll kind of give you just a quick skinny on that as we move to the next slide. You'll see the first agent that we have up there is ketoconazole. That's really going to be completely limited from an oral perspective. You're not going to use it. Not that it doesn't do the job, but it is laden with uh, drug interactions. So it can cause some pretty serious problems if patients are on other agents that also need the liver enzymes to be broken down. So we tend to not use ketoconazole much systemically if we can help it. The biggies that you guys are going to see from a systemic antifungal perspective are going to be down there at the bottom. You see fluconazole, brand name is Diflucan. Um, we, this drug came out, I think in the, in the late nineties, I actually remember I was on a payphone when I saw that it was approved in the lobby of Temple University Hospital. And I was so excited. Um, that being said, it's great for kind of the, you know, uh, aspergillus type infections, um, that you might see in some patients. And it really has one of the lowest interactions with the liver enzymes. So we love this drug. Resistance is becoming a problem because we also use it for vaginal candidiasis infections or vaginal yeast infections. And on the next slide, I'll show you the other agent that you see used uh, a fair amount in ocular fungal infections um, or like exaphthalmitis. Did I say that right? Endo and ophthalmitis for, you can tell I'm not an optometrist, uh, due to a fungal infection, voriconazole is another favorite. Voriconazole is one of the newer agents, but still it's been around for probably 10, 12 years. Um, it's great against some of the more resistant or bigger um, fungal species. One thing about the voriconazole is that it has some unique side effects. It can cause transient visual disturbances in upwards of 30% of people. That's a lot. So we always warn people about this. If you see anything weird, um, it's from the drug. So you take the drug and it's gone within 30 to 60 minutes, visual or even auditory kind of hallucinations. Um, but it's, it's a pretty, you know, unique medication in the, in that we reserve it for some of our infections that can't be treated with fluconazole. After this came out, it's a femme, it's Ibrexafungurp. Look at that chemical name, Ibrexafungurp. So you can tell it's an antifungal right in the name. It's a me too drug for vaginal yeast infections, but I, I threw it in here because you will see it being studied and used um, for off-label uses. The one thing I would say I like about the Brexafem, um, the, you know, Ibrexafungurp is that it gives better coverage than fluconazole for resistant organisms. Right now it's only approved for vaginal yeast infections, but I think it's going to have some utility, uh, even in ocular um, mycoses, fungal species years from now, maybe not quite so long. Um, Greg, there was one question that popped up here. Oh, are you going to do that? The, the chat said, oh, go ahead. Yeah, because I see it says, please review the doxy taper for long term. And I figure we can kind of wrap up here. And then Kyle has a question in there for you. Yeah, the um, You're going to have to go. I have very little uh, experience in the fungal arena. I did treat three uh, fungal cornea infections back in the day, uh, whenever it was the contact lens solution. It's kind of slipping my mind now the the fungus that was involved with that. But I did treat three cornea fungal, but we kind of did it all topical and very little bit of oral assistance. But since then, I have very little uh, fungal uh, exposure. But when it comes to treating meibomian gland dysfunction, you know, if they're, if they're inspissated where, you know, you push on the meibomian gland and it's very thick toothpaste-like, toothpaste I will at times get to that antibiotic uh, therapeutic dosage of 100 milligrams once or twice a day. 
my thought process is killing off some of the staph epidermidis, some of the staph bugs that are on the eye, creating this light paste will help reduce the amount of light paste along by killing the bug and then using 50 milligrams. All you need is about 50 or 40 milligrams once or twice a day to get that light paste inhibition. But that's the key of why they need to be on it for six to 12 months. You have to just be careful with the patients that are on Coumadin uh, and Digoxin because it can affect those levels. And you just, just call to the dermatologist or to the cardiologist, let them know to check those levels over time. And then once you get reversal, then you can take them down to like 50 or 20 milligrams a day, uh, once or twice a day based, and you can get a pill cutter out there that, uh, that they can cut those, uh, cut the 50 milligrams in half. But the key is, you know, kind of starting off high and then slowly over time, there are people that just have skin problems that they just need to be on a low maintenance dose. So 20, 25 milligrams is perfect for them. Uh, the fungal question I'll get real quick about the griseofulvin. Griseofulvin has been around forever, and it is a great an, uh, antifungal agent for ringworm type infections um, or, or anything similar in ilk uh, to ringworm. So um, from a side effect perspective, it's very well tolerated. The one downside to griseofulvin is that it's not always as effective as it used to be because of resistant organisms that, you know, have... have um, you know, had mutations and uh, variations on their structure and their ability to um, not be affected by our antifungals. So otherwise, there's really no downside to griseofulvin. And in many cases, you see practitioners using griseo first for um, a ringworm type infection anywhere on the body. And I'll take the last question there, unless someone else rolls in there, is um, you know, how fast can a patient develop the hyperpigmentation with doxy? And I'm going to answer that a couple of different ways, or you know, I'm going to answer the first question is you'll see patients coming in and minocycline and doxycycline from primary care docs and dermatologists look for the side effects that can occur, the hyperpigmentations, the optic nerve head swelling, so on and so forth. I have probably picked up people just by telling them, hey, I see you're on doxy, I'll see if your nerve is swollen, but don't forget that there's pigmentations. And I actually have people coming in and say, hey, doc, you see these smart fingers that I'm having here? Is this what the side effect could be? I'm like, yeah, that could happen. The, the typical time is about one to two years that they're on there is what I've seen in the literature. The patient that I created it in, she was about nine months, but she was you know, a, a cancer surviving patient where she took a lot of chemotherapy. And as we know, you know, we need that chemotherapy to, to, to kill those cancer cells, but it does change the body chemistry. So I think that's what, what happened to her. She was nine months. So let's just say nine months and beyond, unless Tracy, you have a better answer for that. It's out there, the hyperpigmentation with the minocycline. The original literature said six months or longer. And now that we've, you know, studied it a lot more over the past 20 years or more, we do see the longer, you know, nine months, 12 months and longer tends to be the, the more likely scenario. So any more polls, no more polls, we're good. Okay. We're all polled out. We had our, uh, uh, we had our polls. Um, it looks like we're not getting any more um, questions come in here. So I'll just say thank you. Thanks everyone for taking. Thank you, you know, everyone. Oral pharmaceutical agents and eye care pearls from optometrists and pharmacists. Tr Tracy, always a pleasure to share the podium with you. Thanks for being always. here. Always a pleasure, everybody. Thanks so much for spending your Sunday mornings with us. Joe, any comments before I move into the housekeeping? Well, you're really getting your 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 virtual round of applause. Everybody's very happy. Very everybody's very uh, thank you very much for it. Uh, there, it was an insightful, very scientific, uh, very clinical and practical presentation. I think that's going to help everybody. So, thank you both very much. Thanks, thanks, Joe. Thanks. All right, the housekeeping here. So. We have another uh, webinar tonight at, uh, at 7 p.m. It's going to be Dr. Andy Gerwood, Mark Myers. They're going to be doing ocular manifestations, manifestations of diabetes. We'll also be back uh, on Tuesday with Dr. Mike Shiglazian doing managing glaucoma with OCT imaging. He did a great job a few weeks back, wasn't able to get through any or all of the OCT imaging. It was 
highly demanded. And so we have Mike coming back to do that on Tuesday from 7 to 9 p.m. We are wrapping up the year here with our webinars. We are going to continue into 2022. Joe's done some research on that. So as soon as I get through this list, Joe, I'll have you make some comments on what's going to happen in 2022. But we have you know, requests for pediatric uh, eye care. So we're having uh, Needy come in and do that. We have what's wrong with the cornea and some sclerals coming in with Katie. Um, an MD here, uh, kind of back to back, two MDs, uh, one of the world's renowned in ocular uh, oncology. We have Tim Murray and then Life Without Blebs. We have uh, Dr. Brown, and we thought we were going to wrap up with clinical purpuree with uh, Chris Putnam, but a few weeks back, a lot of people liked the discussion that Mark Dunbar, myself, and Joe were having with the glaucoma, so we're going to do glaucoma clinical case conversations, and that will be on December 20th, which is a Monday, which is totally out of the normal, so watch out for that on that Monday, trying to stay away from the holidays. But Joe, 2022? Well, 2022... Uh... Well, let's talk about 2021. COPE had a ruling that allowed us to have these, these interactive webinars count as live education, as if we were all face-to-face -face in a live meeting. And this is due to COVID. Well, that is kind of that is coming to the end at, at the end of the at the end of this month. What we're going to be starting off with for webinars, it'll be distance-based learning. It won't count for live education. But there are states, many states, that allow a certain amount of distance-based uh, learning. It's not not enduring. You know, that's where you can take it any time. You'll have it'll be very similar to what we're doing right now, but they won't be counting as cope live hours as if they were you know, face to face in a in a lecture hall. It'll be distance-based learning, and various states will allow it. So everybody who participates will have to be aware of what their state does allow, but we will be doing some live webinars in 2022. A question came in, will the OCT lecture be different? COPE approved lecture, none of our, everything that we're doing will be a new COPE number. Nothing will be repeated that we have out there. Is that correct, Joe? That is correct. And, and this is really a new lecture by Dr. Shiglazi. It's not part two. He, he, a lot of things he didn't get through. So he wanted to come back and, uh, and talk about this aspect. But it is a different presentation. Different Coke number, different yes. presentation. Perfect. So upcoming live meetings, our 2022 lineup is, is up. Uh, most of the websites are out there, but we have uh, just our... IT persons on maternity leave, so things are a little bit slower with uh, with things kind of happening out there. So just bear with us as we get through. But we have this one already up. We have our midwinter getaway, Scottsdale, Arizona. Strasbourg, France will be May 12th through the 14th. We're gonna head back down to Florida uh, in June 10th through the 12th. We got Mackinac Island, August 26th, 28th. And we're returning back to the Music City which we were there just a few weeks ago, but it's going to be October this year. And then, Joe, you've been working on the Northern Escape. Do you want to give a highlight of this, of that, and then any of the other meetings that we just talked about? We're hoping perhaps maybe September, but that it is not, uh, it is not finalized. We have to look at the, uh, the pandemic, the border crossings, as well as, uh, as venue availability. But we'll have more information, hopefully, church, shortly. So final housekeeping, just remember that it's wise guys on the credit card bill. I'm not getting those questions and calls as much anymore. Um, that's doing business as optometric education consultant. Post event emails, there'll be one that will happen today. Uh, please complete it. We'll have the post event survey. We'll see about the handout. Someone reported that the handout needs to be cleaned up on that. I'll talk to the IT person. Um, within the next 24 to 48 hours, there'll be two emails, one with the certificate, and one with a replay in the post-event survey. Again, please can please complete that. Today we had Daisha on as our COPE uh, uh, administrator and our OEC conference administrator. She'll take care of sending out those information to COPE. Um, just give COPE about a week or two, maybe three weeks to get this to you into your uh, OE tracker. For those states that don't use COPE, you'll get an email certificate 
But if you also do use COPE, you'll get that email certificate. So everyone gets an email certificate and we'll get things uploaded to COPE to those who supplied us those Arbo numbers. All right, Joe, what did I miss? Anything here? I don't think so, Greg. Uh, it is it is pretty comprehensive. I think we're all, all set and we'll probably see a lot of people tonight. Yep. See everyone tonight. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye now.